Good evening, Sosso Yacht Club members and members of the community. This is Tom Kowalski speaking. Sosso Yacht Club in Sausalito. This is a continuation of our Wednesday night speaker series. Um, we have this event Zoom uh, virtual at this point. We hope to have it back in the club physically sometime in the future. But as you may be aware, uh, Marin County once again has shut down indoor dining. It's effective as of Sunday, July 5th. For three weeks um, and we are abiding by that by that decision at the same time I'd like to make an announcement that our galley is open and we are have a um, an expanding takeout menu selection for members to order in um, from the club um, and we invite you to do so um, we have a new executive uh, uh, chef Justin who is doing a terrific job and frankly, takeout has not been something that we have really talked about extensively in the past, but because of the extended uh, closure of our indoor dining, um, we realize that many members don't feel comfortable coming to the deck to dine. So we're offering this option as, as an addendum to our menu service for the club. Um, this evening, we have a special guest. Mr. Peter Dreckmeyer is the policy director for the Trolomy River Trust. He will be speaking about water quality on San Francisco Bay. And as we all have special interests in um, water quality uh, and the like. So please welcome the Saucer Jakob, Mr. Peter Dreckmeyer. Thank you. Well, nice to be with you virtually. Um, good to see some old friends and make some new friends. And appreciate the invitation to join you tonight. So. I'm going to jump right in with um, a PowerPoint and share a few stories about the Tuolumne River and the Bay. I trust everyone can see the screen. Yeah, great. So um, this is a map of the Tuolumne River. It uh, starts in Yosemite National Park. It, it drains the, the northern half of the park and you can see the Hetch Hetchy Reservoir is in the park. And then it flows downhill through uh, forest land. And there's another large reservoir, Don Pedro, which is mostly for agricultural irrigation. About 200,000 acres in the Central Valley are irrigated with Tuolumne River water. And then the river flows through Modesto. It joins the San Joaquin River. And that flows up into the Delta, uh, where it joins a lot of other rivers, including the Sacramento and continues on into the bay and some of that water even makes it out through the Golden Gate. Most of the water um, comes from snowpack, some comes from rain. So this is uh, up in Yosemite. And this is the headwaters of the Tuolumne. This is the Mount Lyle Glacier. Um, it doesn't provide a lot of water to the river, but it keeps the, the upper uh, stretch wet in the summertime. And it's actually technically not a glacier anymore because it's been shrinking as a result of climate change and it now is no longer uh, moving. It doesn't have enough mass to move. So really it's more of a, an ice sheet at this point. And as uh, snowpack melts, it forms little streams that come together and become the Tuolumne River. This is the Tuolumne and Tuolumne Meadows, which some of you might have visited before, beautiful part of the park. And then it flows down through the Grand Canyon of the Tuolumne and you see a lot of granite here. Yosemite's famous for the granite. It doesn't erode very quickly, so you have these wonderful scenic views, waterfalls, and there's not a lot of sediment in the water. So it's, it's really one of the best drinking water sources in the world. It's actually so clean, it doesn't have to be filtered. It does get treated with chloramine to kill any bacteria, but it's just a fabulous source. And upstream of Hetch Hetchy, it's all national park, no agriculture, no industry. So we're very fortunate. So this is the Hetch Hetchy Reservoir. We, interestingly, we did a, a survey of San Francisco voters a couple of years ago, and 75% could identify Hetch Hetchy as the source of their water, but only 12% could identify the Tuolumne as the river that fills Hetch Hetchy. And so something we point out is that, you know, saying that our water comes from Hetch Hetchy, it's kind of like saying our, our food comes from the grocery store. It's accurate, but there's a, there's a better answer to that. Um, with, with the 
modern day development of San Francisco, people coming from all over the world. Um, for at first, all the water came from local sources, creeks, groundwater. But as the city grew, there were tapped for water and looked to other sources. So you started seeing some reservoirs elsewhere in the Bay Area. This is Crystal Springs in San Mateo County. But San Francisco kept growing, so they're always looking for a bigger, more reliable water source. And there was this beautiful valley in Yosemite, Hetch Hetchy Valley, that they felt would be a perfect site for a dam and a reservoir. This is Michael O'Shaughnessy. He was uh, tasked with uh, moving forward with the project. But there was a lot of opposition from John Muir and the Sierra Club, who argued that Congress should not allow this kind of infrastructure in a national park that belongs to all of us. It's a place to, to get away from development for wildlife to thrive. And Congress agreed. But then in 1906 was the big earthquake and gas lines broke and much of the city caught on fire. And they just didn't have a good uh, water system to put it out. So they went back to Congress, which was more sympathetic. And in 1913, Congress granted San Francisco the right to build what became O'Shaughnessy Dam and created the Hetch Hetchy Reservoir, which was completed in 1923. So this is O'Shaughnessy Dam and the Hetch Hetchy Reservoir. And San Francisco now delivers water to 2.7 million people in the Bay Area. Not quite making it to Marin, but San Francisco most of San Mateo County and then parts of Santa Clara and Alameda counties. So we've, the Bay Area has become very dependent on Tuolumne River water. Uh, Willie Brown, the water is such high quality, Willie Brown toyed with the idea of bottling it and selling it to tourists coming through the airport. But the Raker Act, which gave them the right to uh, tap into Tuolumne River water, uh, pr prohibits them from making money off of it. So that, that didn't go very far, but there are a few of these bottles that you can still find around. So we share the river with a lot of other species. Um, rainbow trout are a really special species of fish. They <clears throat> start their lives in freshwater all the time. They can live their whole life there and, and, and spawn and reproduce. But if they have access uh, to the ocean, sometimes they'll travel hundreds of miles and they'll turn into a saltwater fish called a steelhead and they'll live in the ocean for a couple, three years, and when it's time to spawn, they have to come back to fresh water and start the cycle over again. And they bring all those nutrients from the ocean into the upland habitats. So the fish below O'Shaughnessy Dam cannot become steelhead trout because there's that other large dam, Don Pedro. Um, but we still do have some steelhead in the lower Tuolumne. And of course, there are a lot of species that love Fish is one of my favorites, the, the river otter. And people enjoy recreating on the Tuolumne. It's a world-class um, run there, it's class four, which means very exciting. And it's, you have to get a permit or go with a, um, a, an outfitter. So there's not a ton of people on the river and it's just a great opportunity to, to get away for a while. Um, part of the highlight is you, you, you're out there with the excitement and then we camp out and it's just so peaceful. Um, exploring nature, some people like to fish and falling asleep to the sound of, uh, of the water is just such a wonderful experience. A uh, lot of great places to swim or waterfalls or someone doing a little fly fishing. So for all these reasons, the, the Upper Tuolumne was designated a wild and scenic river in 1984. Our organization was founded in 1981 when there were more dams proposed for the Tuolumne. Uh, this is, was our first executive director, John Amadio, testifying. On the far left of the table is Richard Chamberlain. Some people might remember him from the Thornton Birds. And he became the champion, kind of a national spokesperson for the Tuolumne. They got him out on the river. He fell in love with it. And every time he did an interview, he insisted, I want to talk about the Tuolumne. So we have some really fun um, clips of him being on Good Morning America and all these other programs. Uh, and we were successful in convincing 
uh, Congress to designated Wild and Scenic River and sign into uh, law by President Reagan. So here's the Tuolumne River watershed, and you can see the Big Don Pedro Reservoir kind of in the middle there. Um, the 83 miles upstream of that are Wild and Scenic River, which means no new dams, no development along the banks. And then below that is called the Lower Tuolumne River. So this is uh, one of the dams that separates the two. This is Don Pedro. The Don Pedro Reservoir is the sixth largest in the state. And it has the uh, ability, has enough capacity to capture all the water flowing down the river in, a given, in an average year. So it's a very big, big reservoir. And two miles downstream is the oldest dam on the Tuolumne, LaGrange, which was built in 1893. And so below LaGrange is where we still have some salmon. Um, both those dams are currently going through a relicensing process through the federal government. So it's an opportunity for us to uh, catch up with some of the environmental laws that came into existence after it got its original license, which was in the mid 60s. And in the early 70s, Clean Water Act, Endangered Species Act, a lot of the wonderful uh, legislation. So we've been working on this for nine or 10 years, trying to improve conditions in the lower Tuolumne. So this is a, a stretch of the river that's very different than the whitewater up higher. Uh, but this is where the salmon still spawn. And we do canoeing with the salmon trips in early November. So we actually see salmon coming up to spawn. These are Chinook salmon. And they're also called king salmon because they're the largest salmon. Usually they don't get this big. This one was 108 pounds. Um, but you can see this one's missing its eye. It actually uh, had spawned and died. And the life cycle of salmon is they're born in the freshwater, like rainbow trout. Uh, they need to go out to the ocean and live there for two and a half years or a little bit longer. This one probably was out there for four or five years. And they get really fat on all that food, all those nutrients in the ocean. And when it's time for them to spawn, they stop eating. Uh, they'll come up to the very same river where they were born, if they have access to it. They can actually smell the water and they use electromagnetism uh, to get there. And often will spawn in the same section of the river where they were born. So the female will lay about 5,000 eggs, the male will fertilize them, and then they die. And animals will eat the carcasses and all those nutrients fuel a food web and fertilize soils and, and vegetation, etc. So we really focus on the fact it's not just about one species, it's about a, a whole ecosystem that depends on the, this conveyor belt of nutrients from the ocean. So of the 5,000 eggs, most get eaten by other creatures. Of the juveniles, most get eaten. Of the adults, most get eaten, including by humans. And on average, maybe about two will survive to be reproducing adults. So it's kind of population stabilization. So some other things we're doing on the Lower Tuolumne is we've been working on um, a series of parks to give people access to the river and provide habitat for wildlife. We have a program that uses as a living laboratory for uh, young students. They come out and learn about water quality and, and plants and animals and trying to get people to appreciate the river that runs through their community of, of Modesto. Uh, we take a lot of youth out and teach them about uh, recreation skills, whether it's boating or fishing or biking along the river. Again, really encouraging appreciation for this incredible resource. And water quality monitoring, the community can be involved with. Uh, this guy's a real hero, Chris Guptel. He um, started boating out on the river and there was all this garbage around Modesto. So he started a program called Operation 9 to 99, cleaning up a stretch between the uh, 9th Street Bridge and Highway 99. And you can see they've had 59 cleanups, 503 tons of garbage, uh, it looks so much better and it's really engaging the community. Um, lots of shopping carts um, and hypodermic needles, tires. Here's a before shot and an after. Uh, this was a fun project we just accomplished uh, last year. There was this old dam, a small dam um, in the Modesto area that really became dilapidated. You could see here there's a, an abandoned boat and that's water hyacinth, the non-native species. Um, it, it's been dangerous. A couple of kids have died here. They get caught in the, in the circulating hole. 
Um, it's been bad for, for salmon migration. And no one wanted to do anything about it because they didn't want to admit that it was their issue. They didn't want to get sued. But we convinced the uh, city of Modesto to partner with us. We raised the money to do the environmental studies and remove the dam. And we celebrated with the mayor and other um, VIPs uh, first time in decades that we were able to bite, boat through that section. And we've actually seen a really good improvement in the migration of fish through that section as well. This is Dos Rios, where the two rivers meet, the, the Tuolumne and the San Joaquin. Uh, we purchased it in 2012, uh, 1,600 acres, uh, cost $22 million. We raised the money through mostly through federal and state grants. And that area is now being restored to wildlife habitat. It, there's a riparian brush rabbit up there at the top. It's one of the most endangered species um, in the area. And we've seen it um, coming back to the Dos Rios uh, former ranch site. So that's been exciting. And here's the big challenge to the Tuolumne is that in an average year, only 21% makes it all the way to San Joaquin. So humans divert four out of every five gallons. And that's had some very big impacts on the river. The breakdown of water going to agriculture versus urban areas is the same as it is statewide. About 80% of what we call developed water, water used by humans is used for agriculture. And you see here during the uh, drought, the amount of nuts grown increased. So even though we were in a drought, more and more water was being used for a crop that is largely exported. And in California, water is a public trust resource. It means it belongs to the people of California. Now there are water rights, but the state has the ability to determine uh, which beneficial uses um, have priority. And you could argue that you know, farmers who are growing water for, um, for, for produce for Californians and the price of, of that produce isn't very high, maybe that's a beneficial use for the people of California. But when they're exporting the crop overseas, they're, uh, they're gaining all the benefit and our environment and the ecosystem are paying the price. So uh, that's something that we've been encouraging uh, the state water board to look at. Another problem is, you know, they're growing more food, but a lot of that was pumping groundwater. And when you over pump, you can have problems like land subsidence. Uh, this is a great photo on the left here. You can see that the land in 1925 was way up higher. And because the water has been over pumped, the land actually um, sinks. And that can cause all sorts of problems with infrastructure, um, as well as we're losing that capacity to, to store water, which is an underground reservoir. So this shows just how bad things are on the Tuolumne. Um, the state, there's a, a salmon doubling goal. So the goal was to double the amount of salmon. And you can see on the right there that not only have we not made any progress on the Tuolumne, but we are, are um, seeing fewer salmon. Uh, historically, there were well over 100,000 sa salmon spawning every year. This last year, we had about 2,000. So we're hovering in the low thousands, sometimes just hundreds. And the block there in red, those are the three main tributaries to the San Joaquin River. Um, when we talk about the Bay Delta Plan phase one, you can see that they're the rivers that have been hurt the most. And that's why they've been a priority early on in the process. So here's the Delta where all this fresh water meets the salt water from the Bay and creates a brackish estuary which is just so bountiful with, with wildlife and, and food for uh, migrating species. And then we've got the bay flowing through the Golden Gate out to the Pacific Ocean. Now, um, the, the, the Bay Delk ecosystem, no one argues, it is in a state of crisis. It's been crashing. And we have this opportunity with the Bay Delta Water Quality Control Plan to improve conditions. So the Bay Delta Plan was required by the Clean Water Act. It was first implemented in 1978. It was updated in 1995, but really hasn't had any changes since then. So it's been 25 years. And legislation in 2009 required that, that it be updated. And it's, again, it's a slow process, but we are making a little bit of progress. 
So about half of the water that falls on California drains out through the Bay Delta. And the estuary provides habitat for more than 500 species of fish and wildlife. So it's just an incredible ecosystem. It's one of the, um, the health, best ecosystems on the planet when it's healthy. Uh, it's a major stopover for the Pacific Flyway. It's a migration corridor for salmon and steelhead and other anadromous fish that share their life between the freshwater. <laughs> And a little bit of music. Maybe people could go on, on mute for right now. And so with the, the um, gold rush and all people moving to California, the Delta started getting developed for agriculture and uh, the rivers were constrained by levees and we started diverting more and more water from upstream. And that's had a huge impact. So low flows, they affect water temperature, which is really important for native fish species and water quality. They can dilute out pollutions, uh, pollution and uh, toxic chemicals. Um, obviously, fish need enough water to get to their spawning grounds and for the juveniles to get fleshed out to the bay and ocean when they're ready. Floodplains are really important for, especially for juvenile salmon. Uh, they, uh, they have refuge from predator fish. So a lot of the predators in these systems now are non-native fish like bass, and they're in the main channel. So if there are floodplains, the, the baby fish can take refuge there. There's more food, they can get bit bigger. And when it's time for them to uh, out-migrate, they have a better chance of surviving the gauntlet of predators. So floodplains are really important. Um, what we've done is we've altered the ecosystem so much that it now favors non-native species that ev have evolved under this similar conditions. So species that like slower moving warm water like bass are doing really well. And the native species that like faster moving cold water uh, are at a disadvantage. Uh, here's a, a, a non-native plant species, water hyacinth. And during the recent drought, it just clogged mile upon mile of the Tuolumne River. And you can imagine underneath that are, are um, predators like bass waiting to, to snatch up the baby salmon on their way out. Uh, you might have heard about the toxic algae blooms in the Delta. So this slow moving stagnant water uh, harbors this cyanobacteria, which creates neurotoxins that can make people sick and can kill pets and wildlife. And we've changed the, the salt balance of, of the bay. And this affects everything from plankton at the base of the food web all the way up to the top. And you can see that the unimpaired flow, that's what would come down the river in the absence of dams and diversions, only naturally one time in the last 50 years in 1977 was it super critically dry. But because of all the diversions, um, in actuality, in 40% of the years, it's been super critically dry. And in 60% of the years, either super critically dry or dry. So we've basically created a permanent drought for the Bay De Delta estuary. And a lot of fish species have been in decline because of that. And it works its way all the way up the food web to orcas out in the Pacific Ocean that depend on salmon. And we still have a, a viable commercial, commercial salmon fishing industry, um, but it's always quite parallel. Some years it's better than other years. And conditions were so bad in 2008 and 2009 that the salmon fishing season had to be canceled for the first time in history. So uh, the, the folks who depend on uh, salmon fishing are really in peril as well. And you can see here, there, there are arguments that the water agencies talk about, you know, producing more fish with less water, but you can see a direct correlation between flows and um, fish survival. Um, it's very apparent. So phase one of the Bay Delta plan focused on the San Joaquin Basin, um, the, the Tuolumne, the Stanislaus, and the Merced Rivers. And it was a long process. There are a lot of hearings, a lot of comments submitted, a lot of lobbying and advocacy, but finally at the end of 2018, um, we convinced the State Water Board to adopt 
uh, higher flows for these rivers. And what they adopted was something different than what we've done in the past. In the past, there have been like minimum flows. You have to re release just this much water at least. Um, but now we're looking at a percentage of unimpaired flow to try to, to mimic the natural cycle. And that would be between February and June, which are really critical months for, for the baby fish. And so if it's a big water year, um, more water will end up in the river. If it's drier, less water. And then if there's a, a storm, you see higher flows in the river for that time period and then hold back. So really trying to mimic nature more. And for the Tuolumne, this would be a big improvement because in an average year, we currently only see 21%. So the plan was adopted, but there are a number of other steps that need to be implemented before the plan can be implemented. Um, interesting thing about it is that they try to incentivize um, what we call non-flow measures like habitat restoration and control of invasive predator fish. So um, if goals and objectives can be met with less water, the unimpaired flow could go down to 30%. Um, if they're not being met at 40%, it could go up to 50%. So there's a real incentive for everyone to work together to improve conditions and make sure we have a healthy ecosystem as well as a, uh, a robust water supply. So it was no surprise to us that the, uh, the irrigation districts in the Central Valley sued the, the State Water Board. Um, they don't really have a strong environmental ethic and basically take however much water they can and expand acreage um, because the economy is so dependent on agriculture. Uh, we were disappointed though that the San Francisco Public Utilities Commission joined them in suing. And you know, we've, we did a, a public opinion survey a couple of years ago. We found tremendous support for the environment, for the Bay, for the Tuolumne River in San Francisco. So they're really not representing the, uh, the interest of their constituents. Part of the reason is that they kind of get pushed around a little bit by the irrigation districts, which have senior water rights on the Tuolumne. And they, um, they signed this agreement in 1995 that they would follow the irrigation district's lead on fish flows. So basically, they've given up uh, their ability to think and act independently and are dependent on the position of the irrigation districts. So right out of the gate, when the environmental document came out for the Bay Delta Plan, um, SFPUC and uh, the representative of their wholesale customers, which is a group called BOSCA, uh, Bay Area Water Supply and Conservation Agency, which represents the, the um, cities and agencies outside of San Francisco that got Hetch Hetchy water, had this um, op-ed and they claimed, oh my gosh, you know, we could face 50% rationing 188,000 jobs lost, $49 billion lost. So we started doing a lot of our own um, assessment of the situation. And between 2006 and 2016, we reduced our demand from Hetch Hetchy by 30%. So we really did a great job at conserving water. And according to their analysis, the 30% reduction in water use should have resulted in the loss of 25,000 jobs, which it didn't, and the loss of six and a half billion dollars. But in fact, in that time frame, we added jobs grew by 27%, that's the blue line, and water demand dropped by 23%. So it was really quite remarkable, um, the opposite of what anyone might have predicted. And a big driver for that has been the, the price of water. It's, it's um, tripled in the last, 12 years, and that sent a really strong price signal. So back in 2007, the SFPUC was projecting that demand by 2018 would be 285 million gallons per day, MGD. Um, they wanted to take more water from the Tuolumne. We opposed that. Um, they, they were also moving forward on some seismic upgrades to the system, which they didn't want to slow down. So we reached a compromise where they capped water sales at 265. And then even before the drought, it had dropped to 223. Again, it was that price signal. And then it got as low as 175 million gallons per day in 2016. And it stayed there in 2017. And in 2018, it was 196. So their projections were off by 31%. And that's something we see a lot is water agencies, they're planning for demand being a lot higher um, than it's likely to be because they don't want to run out of water. But then they tend to hoard water at the expense of the environment. So this shows how um, price increase 
has uh, driven down demand. And they have a new 10-year financial plan that proje projects that sales are going to go down by half a percent per year. So that could be a positive thing for the Tuolumne. We're not going to be needing as much water, but we need to make sure it stays in the river. So 85% um, of SFPUC water comes from the Tuolumne. 15% comes from Bay Area watersheds. Um, this is how the water rights work for the Raker Act, that the first 2,400 cubic feet per second CFS coming down the Tuolumne belongs to the irrigation districts. So a cubic foot, imagine a, a basketball. So the first 2,400 basketballs coming down the river, all that water belongs to the irrigation districts. But anything over that um, belongs to the SFPUC. And then there's a two-month period, you can see we call it the top hat, where that goes up to 4,000. That's during the, the peak runoff. So in wet years, San Francisco has incredible water rights, much more water than they could possibly uh, use or store. But it's in these series of dry years where they start getting nervous. You see years like 2014 and 15, um, they really weren't able to add much water to their storage. But in an average year, they're entitled to three times as much water as they need. So they can rebound after a drought pretty quickly. And the, the Hetch Hetchy is only about a quarter of their storage. They also have some other reservoirs on the Tuolumne. They have the ability to prepay some water to the irrigation districts in Don Pedro and then um, take water at Hetch Hetchy when they otherwise wouldn't be uh, entitled to. So they have enough at full capacity, they have enough water to last six years. And at the height of the drought, they still had enough water to last three years. And then 2016, which was an average water year. And in that summer, they had enough water to last five years. So when the state was still technically in drought, um, San Francisco was in very good shape. And then in 2017, which was a really big water year, they were entitled to enough water to last 12 years. But with their storage pretty close to, to full, they had to, what we say, dump. They had to, to spill 88% of their entitlement. So uh, we ended up having one excessively good year at the expense of five terrible years preceding it. So what we did is we modeled, well, what would happen if the drought of record, which was six years, 87 to 92, repeated, and the Bay Delta plan, the 40% unpaired flow was in effect, and water demand rebounded a little bit to 223, and we found that with just an average of 10% rationing, they could make it through the worst drought on record. And that's when the SFPUC said, well, we're preparing for our design drought. So their design drought takes the two worst droughts of the last century and combines them sequentially. So they're planning for an eight and a half year drought at demand of 265 million gallons per day. So you can, you know, depending on how long you're planning for, how much demand you're planning for, you can create any numbers that, that you want. And so their drought sequence is much more conservative than any other major water agency. And a colleague of mine did a probability analysis. He looked at tree ring data for the last 1,100 years to figure out you know, what, how much water was available in the system each year. And he sequenced every eight year um, stretch. And he found that there are only a handful of years that we would have gotten into year six of the design drought and never into year seven or eight. So again, tremendous support for the Bay and the Tuolumne River in San Francisco. And a real, the major driver for people to conserve water is to benefit the environment. For 71%, that played a major role. And then for another 20, 23%, it played some role. But people are furious when they find out that the water they conserved during the drought didn't benefit the Tuolumne. And that's because right now we have just these base flow um, requirements that as long as they're releasing a certain amount of water into the river, um, they're okay. And so this is what happens. You can see um, years 2012 to 2016, where the unimpaired flow, making it all the way down to the uh, San Joaquin River, averaged just 12%. So 12% of unimpaired flow for five years. And then in 2017, they had to dump all that water that people had conserved they were actually releasing water at the maximum amount they're allowed through the flood control uh, rules from early January into the summer. 
And so the Tuolumne was full and the San Joaquin River was full and it was a very good year for the ecosystem, but it came at a cost that the previous five years were uh, in very poor shape. So there's still a lot we can do with a water efficiency and conservation. Um, there are rebates now for uh, these front loading washing machines that use 40% less water, low flow shower heads. You can often get those free from a water agency. They use half as much water and you can't really tell the difference. The toilets now are about a gallon per flush. When I was growing up, they were about five. So there's still some low hanging fruit there. Um, we ran a program called the Silicon Valley Water Conservation Awards for 10 years. And it was just neat to see all the innovative programs out there. There's a lot of uh, technology that's coming online and programs and uh, very rewarding to see all that's happening. Uh, landscaping is probably the lowest hanging fruit. Um, you know, grass and things that have, have evolved in areas that get rain in the summertime are not appropriate for California. We have dry summers, but there are a lot of native plants or um, Mediterranean plants that do well and can be very beautiful and, and reduce our water demand a lot. We're now seeing people installing gray water systems where they capture wastewater from their shower or washing machine and use it to irrigate plants instead of sending it into the uh, sewer system. And then recycled water at a bigger scale, uh, running purple pipe so that people know not to drink the water and that's mostly for irrigation but we're now seeing more advanced purified water, which is using microfiltration, reverse osmosis, ultraviolet light to clean up the water. I call it astronaut water. And for a lot of places, it's higher quality than what they're getting. Um, in the Hetch Hetchy area, it's kind of hard to beat Hetch Hetchy. But in Santa Clara County, where they're depending a lot on Delta water, um, this water is actually cleaner. You gotta overcome the yuck factor. That, you know, back in the, originally there were campaigns to stop toilet to tap, but we're really seeing a shift in attitudes. And um, I think we're gonna see a lot more of this um, recycling water for drinking. In Orange County, they actually produce 100 million gallons per day. What they do is called um, indirect potable reuse, where they clean up the water, it filters down, through the soil, recharges groundwater, and then they use that groundwater for, for uses. And actually the water going in is cleaner than the groundwater because it picks up some contaminants. So uh, people are starting to look at direct potable reuse. Uh, there's still a lot of, of low hanging fruit and nuts in the Central Valley. Um, drip irrigation can save a lot of water. The challenge is that it costs money. And the farmers in Stanislaw County that um, get Tuolumne River water, they pay $20 an acre foot. So an acre foot, imagine a football field a foot deep in water. We pay $2,000. We pay 100 times more. So there's a really strong price signal here, but they don't have a lot of incentive to install um, drip irrigation. And, and that's an opportunity for the, for the San Francisco PUC that perhaps uh, we could invest there where conservation's much more affordable and then share in the savings. Um, it's probably about $200 an acre foot to save water in the Central Valley, much more expensive than the Bay Area. And then ultimately, if we did experience a really long drought, uh, we would be able to buy water from irrigation districts. And even if they didn't want to sell water for some reason, um, the state could say, you shall sell water. And we did a, a quick uh, analysis, and we found that if you include the multiplier effect, so the value of an acre foot for in agriculture for the farmer, for the processor, for the distributor, for the laborers. Um, it comes to between $500 and $1,000 an acre foot for uh, low value crops. And we're used to paying $2,000 an acre foot in the Bay Area. So uh, we could have a system where everyone in the Central Valley makes the same amount of money that they would, but they don't have to do any work. And we have water in an extreme situation where we have a worse drought than we've ever had before. So there are solutions out there. Uh, we could also help uh, invest in groundwater recharge in the Central Valley and share in the credit. So I'm wrapping up here, um, there's a lot happening. We're um, always looking for people to join us. We do a lot of advocacy. 
We get people to call into meetings. One thing about coronavirus is um, it's a lot easier to comment now. You can just call into an SFPUC meeting or another water agency and from the comfort of your own home. So um, here's my email address if anyone's interested in um, getting involved with what we're doing. And I will now stop sharing and see if we might have some questions or comments. Well, thank you, Peter. I think we do. Uh, why don't we go ahead with the questions uh, sort of down the order and everybody else, if you have questions, please put them into chat. But we'll start off with uh, Tom. You had a couple questions right at the beginning. Yeah, Peter, terrific presentation. Thank you. And it's something that I've always been interested in. A uh, couple questions. Um, there was a discussion in the past of tearing down the O'Shaughnessy Dam. Is that even in, in any discussion at this particular time, restoring the Hetch Hetchy Valley? Uh, yes, it's, it's still being discussed. Um, there's a group called Restore Hetch Hetchy, and that is their sole mission. Um, our organization, we have not taken a position on that. Um, so our board felt that it would, once you take a position on that, that becomes your mission. That's what everyone knows you for. And it would interfere with a lot of the, the work that we're doing. We're doing a lot of work about around the rim fire recovery in the upper Tuolumne and, and trying to improve forest management to avoid these mega fires in the future. Um, we have a lot of education programs, advocacy programs, um, mm -hmm. habitat restoration. So the, um, I think most people feel that it was probably a mistake to put a reservoir in Yosemite National Park. But then the question is, well, it's there now. Um, what do we do about it? It would be pretty expensive to remove it, probably two or $3 billion. And so you have to ask, is that the best use of two or $3 billion or are there other things we could do? A lot of the reason why uh, dams get removed is because they block salmon. But the salmon, probably didn't make it all the way up to Hetch Hetchy. There's a, a waterfall downstream called Preston Falls, which would probably be too challenging. So then you also have to ask about, um, you know, we have this system that's gravity fed all the way to the Bay Area. So we're not pumping water like in Southern California, you got to pump water over the grapevine and we're generating hydropower along the way. So from a, a greenhouse gas perspective, um, it's a pretty good system. And the alternative, and we don't have to filter the water. So if, the idea would be that maybe we would, uh, there would be a raise of Don Pedro Dam, and then water would have to get pumped from, from there into the system and have to be filtered. So, um, I, you know, I admire the folks who are trying to restore Hetch Hetchy Valley. I think it's a, it's a tough mission. Um, and there are a lot of other things we can be focusing on. Right, right. Well, thank you. I have three other questions. Um, the, the lower dam just below San Pedro you mentioned is back to 1890. How viable is that? My second question is Jerry Brown at some point talked about diverting water just north of the delta, just above Sacramento. I would call it the peripheral canal, but it was, he called it a delta restoration. Mm -hmm. uh, is that finished? And then uh, just a general question is, what's SoCal doing, Southern California doing in terms of water conservation? Thank okay. you. All good questions, yeah. So LaGrange Dam, yeah, was built in 1893. It's um, built out of cobble rock from the, from the river. And it's basically, um, the purpose of that is to elevate the river about 180 feet. So then it can go through canals on both sides and use gravity to um, fill reservoirs that irrigate the lands in the Turlock Irrigation District and the Modesto Irrigation District. So it's not holding back a whole lot of water um, and it's a pretty strong dam. And so uh, Don Pedro upstream, that's the one, it kind of regulates the amount of water going into LaGrange and then, and then it's distributed. So it's a, an interesting system that they have. The, um, the Delta Tunnel is something that, uh, so Jerry Brown, in his first stint as governor, he had proposed the peripheral canal. And then in his second stint, um, proposed twin tunnels that would take water from the Sacramento um, upstream of where it, it joins the Delta and through a couple tunnels, bring it to where the Delta pumps are. 
And um, that has, has now morphed into a single tunnel um, that Gavin Newsom is supporting. And the argument for it is that there, right now we have reverse flows in the delta sometimes, that these pumps are so strong <clears throat> that they can actually suck water upstream, which confuses the baby fish because they go with the flow. And then they get um, uh, sucked into an area where the predator fish just wait to eat them. And um, yeah, we also have a problem with saltwater intrusion into um, uh, it, it, some of that salt water ends up on agricultural land if we're pumping too much at the wrong time. So the idea is by uh, taking this water kind of around the delta and getting it closer to where the pumps are, you can eliminate some of that reverse flow. The, um, the concern is that once you have that infrastructure, it's going to be hard to limit how much water they're going to pump, and they'll probably pump more and more water from the Sacramento. So most environmental groups oppose it. <clears throat> um, LA has actually done some amazing things. They, the, the Mono Lake case, which was, I guess, in the 90s. Um, so Mono Lake over on the, the far side of Yosemite, that's yeah. fed by... Um, by Sierra Streams and LA was tapping into that water and getting it down to LA. And they were challenged based on the public trust doctrine and um, they lost. And so they had to um, release more water into Mono Lake to keep it a, a viable habitat for the, yeah. the shrimp that live there and the birds that feed on it. And yeah. so they got really serious. Lost his sound. Somehow I got muted. Uh, so um, they, um, you know, did all sorts of things with um, water efficient toilets and fixtures, and you know, capturing more uh, rain runoff. And Eric Garcetti, the the mayor, he wants to be, I think, you know, fifty percent uh, local water in the next decade or so. So they, um, you know, San Francisco will point out that they have the lowest per capita water use of any major area. And that's true. Um, and LA will point out that they've made the most progress on water conservation and efficiency in the last several decades, which is true. <laughs> I have a question. Yes. Um, so clearly the people in the Bay Area are trying really hard to conserve water, most people. And I am 100% in favor of our farmers in the Central Valley, but you did mention that they're getting their water for a reduced rate. I'll just say it as nice as I can. And it doesn't always benefit the, the citizens of California or even the United States. And, and I'm, I'm, I worry about that because they, that water is, they're not incented to conserve. What, what is your, what are you guys doing about that and how can we help? Yeah, great question. Um, an interesting thing happened in the Modesto Irrigation District. The, so that MID, they provide water and electricity and their electric rate, their electricity customers said, wait a minute, you know, you're only charging the farmers 20% of the cost of delivery for water. That means they're getting subsidized somehow and it's probably through, the electric rate payers. And so this went to court and the um, MID said, well, we actually sell electricity on the open market and it's those profits that we use to subsidize the farmers. But the, the judge didn't buy it. And uh, just this last December ruled in favor of the electric rate payers. And so it's very likely they're gonna have to um, quintuple the price of water and charge the, the full cost, which would be $100 an acre foot, still a lot cheaper than it is in the Bay Area. Um, That's true, but at least it would, pr it would uh, maybe um, promote conservation if it was a cost to them. Right, right. Now, what we've proposed to the governor is that we should charge an export fee for crop water use for crops that are exported. And it doesn't have to be a lot, um, but it's, it says, you know, this is a, a value, this is a, a resource of value to the people of California. And, and then that water could go into a special fund to help farmers do the drip irrigation, pressurized water systems. So um, 
but but what the irrigation districts they have this mentality that they want water to be as cheap as possible for the farmers because they think that, that that's going to keep the economy ticking along and at times the farmers say charge us more you know we want we want infrastructure improvements they um <clears throat> So in 2012, San Francisco wanted to buy water from the Modesto Irrigation District. And it was actually a great deal for MID. It would have been um, a, a waste of money for San Francisco because they, they wouldn't have needed the water. But the farmers rose up and said, we don't want you selling water out of the district. And so it put the MID in a position where they had to, to um, show that they had a lot of opportunities to save water. And they, um, Basically, through infrastructure improvements, they could save about 40,000 acre feet, which is a lot of water. And so San Francisco would pay for those infrastructure improvements. Um, they would then be able to sell San Francisco water. And, um, and that comes to about $200 an acre foot, which the water that San Francisco is looking into developing, like recycled water, would cost 4,000 an acre foot. So I think what we're gonna see is urban areas helping invest in that infrastructure. But a, a bottom line is that without something like the Bay Delta plan that says, you know, this much water needs to remain in the river, they'll just capture whatever they can. And they have become more efficient, but they just expanded acreage into marginal lands. Um, some lands that shouldn't be farmed because there's selenium in the soil or, or they're in you know, flood zones like that. So it's very problematic. Um, most people, you ask them what percentage of, of the California's economy comes from agriculture, they'd say, oh gosh, you know, probably 25 or 30 percent. But the answer is 2 percent. Mm -hmm. But there's so much political clout. And the Democrats in the Central Valley, they're on the same page as Republicans when it comes to, to water that, you know, that they don't want any restrictions. And, and Democrats, you know, they have the super majority in the two houses. So they really want to hold on to those Central Valley seats. So they don't push too hard because they don't want, uh, you know, if, if Democrats in Fresno or other places get replaced by Republicans, they lose their super majority. Mm -hmm. So the politics makes it uh, challenging. Great answers. Yeah. Peter. Um, going to the next question, uh, William Mittendorf, you can unmute and ask your question. Okay, one is kind of a comment, and I think it's one of the things which is rarely talked about is flood control. And a lot of the dams in California were built for flood control. And if you want to get an idea for what the valley looked like before the dams were built, look at the railroad grades, because they were typically built two feet above flood level. And the Central Valley was frequently 30 miles of water for several months of a year. So that's one thing that's very frequently not talked about. Um, the other is if you could comment about the distinctions between striped bass and largemouth bass and how the interface of salt and fresh water meets. And then the other distinction I think you need to make is the distinction between ditch water, which is irrigation water, and tap water, which is, is drinking water. And in the Tuolumne River, it's unusual in that its water quality is so high. And most rivers, particularly in the Sacramento River, which I'm fairly um, trained, which I'm familiar with, because I've sat on a water board for several years, the, the water quality is not like that. And the difference between ditch water and, and tap water is huge. It's night and day. And um, that's kind of, those, those are just things I'd like you to talk about a little bit, if you would. Yeah, so um, really good point about um, flood protection. Um, Don Pedro Dam on the Tuolumne, Army Corps, invested money in that in order to have some capacity for, for flood management. Um, that, the way that works is um, that reservoir can be higher in the summertime when it's not raining and there's no risk of a lot of uh, snow melt coming down. But by October 1st, they have to vacate um, a certain amount of capacity and, and have that available for um, a lot of runoff. In 98, 97, 98, there was a big snowpack and a warm rain came and it overwhelmed the dam and it was spilled over the dam and flooded uh, parts of Modesto. Um, so they're very careful about that. And with climate change, what we're expecting 
is um, bigger swings in precipitation year to year. So we might have you know, drier years and more sequential dry years, and we might have wetter years. And we had a little bit of that recently. We had you know, four very dry years, we had an average year, then we had the second wettest on record, and then back to average. So, um, so there's a lot of talk about uh, how, do we, how do we balance that out? That flood protection and water supply sometimes conflict. If we, there is better monitoring now of, of storms. And so, and, and with LIDAR, they can, they have a much better sense of how much water is in the snowpack. And that will help out with, with management, which will be good for uh, ecosystems as well. Um, definitely a, a big difference between um, tap water and ditch water. The um, <clears throat> Modesto Irrigation District, they do provide surface water to, uh, for about half of Modesto, um, half of Modesto supply. The other half comes from groundwater. Um, groundwater is another water source that can be contaminated. Um, especially in agricultural areas where you might have, you know, byproducts um, that, that run down. The, um, there's a plan right now that the Turlock Irrigation District, they um, installed 20 years ago something called an infiltration gallery, which is about 20 mile, 25 miles downstream of LaGrange Dam, and they have pipes in the, in the bed of the river and what they're proposing, and it's taken a long time, is that they would be able to release more water into the Tuolumne, so you'd have higher flows in the stretch where the salmon spawn, um, so you'd have more spawning habitat, you'd have colder water, and then they would take that water out at the irrigation, um, at the uh, infiltration gallery, and then that water would go to the uh, cities of Turlock and Ceres. So that would improve their water quality. They'd be getting surface water, uh, replacing groundwater. Um, not sure if that answers your question, but again, you know, we, we have water from Sierra Snowpack, from the Sierra. Um, it's not as high quality in Don Pedro, but still you know, better than ditch water, better than groundwater. And some of that water is going to um, uh, tap water. Bill, does that answer your question? Um, yeah, well, sort of. I think most people tend to think of water uh, in, in urban areas as tap water, which is a very, very different product than what's delivered to almost all agriculture. And again, Tuolumne River is such high quality that it's not typical of California rivers, mm -hmm. um, especially in the Sacramento Valley, where so much of the water that comes out of the Delta comes from. And then the other comment was about striped bass, which are definitely a planted species and are major predators, but have also been a large sport fishing um, uh, fish and anyway comment about them if you want I'm curious to know what you think about yeah them. so um, there's a group we work really closely with called the California Sport Fishing Protection Alliance and you know they like sport fish including striped bass um, so they'll say that you know striped bass aren't really the problem and we actually have seen that in years when salmon don't do very well striped bass don't do very well so it's almost like they're they're kind of similar um, but they are um, a scapegoat, and the irrigation districts basically say the problem is we've got these predator fish, and uh, they are proposing having fishing derbies and you know having um, small dams that would keep the striped bass out. And but the bottom line is um, that we've we've altered the ecosystem to favor these non-native species and. When they put in this infiltration gallery that I just mentioned, it was part of a project to fill in a big pit in the river where there had been mining that was harboring um, largemouth bass. And they would just sit there and when the baby fish came down, they'd just pick them off. And what they did, so they, they put in the infiltration gallery, they filled in that pit. And what they found was that the Big mouth bass went away, but the smallmouth bass took over, and they're equally um, voracious predators. And in their own report, they said, well, you know, when we had those big water years in the 90s, it flushed out a lot of the bass, um, and, but some of them would take refuge, and it was really the cold water that kept them from spawning, because they don't like that cold water. So, you could manage the river in a better way to um, take away the, the advantages to, to bass. Um, 
interesting, bass were introduced into the Delta ecosystem in the late 1800s. And so they've been in the system for a long time. Um, as, as recently as 1944, we had 130,000 130, salmon in the Tuolumne River. And what really happened when they, when they uh, built New Don Pedro Dam, and there's a lot less water flowing down the river, that's what really impacted the, uh, the salmon. So um, I'm not an expert on it. I, you know, I've, I've heard arguments that striped bass and, and um, black bass are a big problem. I've heard that they're a symptom of the problem. I tend to agree more with the latter. Great, thank you. I think now we'll go to Patty. I think you have a question for Peter. Patty, are you there? You might be on mute, Patty. I'm trying to unmute her. There she goes. Hi, Tom. I wanted to ask Peter, um, there are a lot of water conservation groups in this area in California. How do you work with them to optimize all your goals? Well, there used to be a, a group called the California, California Urban Water Conservation Committee, I think, Cook went by Cook, And they were um, uh, creating best management practices. So, you know, a series of these are things that um, water agencies should do. And if you signed on to all of them, you got good credit for it. Um, they actually disbanded about a year ago. I don't remember exactly why, um, but I thought that was very useful having that. Um, we, you know, we worked very closely with the SFCC and BOSCA to promote water conservation programs. Our campaign is called Revive the Tuolumne and it has two legs to it. One is uh, Let It Flow, which is we need more water in the ecosystem. Uh, along with, with habitat restoration to improve the system. And then the other is use it wisely. That if we um, conserve water, if we develop alternative water sources, um, then we can afford to put more water in the river and, and um, make sure we have a reliable water supply as well as restoring the ecosystem. So, you know, when, when all these water agencies started suing the state, it's like, gosh, you know, we've been working with you for 10 years, we've seen a dramatic decline in water use. And now it's time to, you know, make sure some of that gets into the ecosystem and you're suing. So we've, we're not putting as much energy into the, the use it wisely. Um, an interesting thing is Valley Water in Santa Clara County, they sued the state. And we said, you know, why? This phase one doesn't even affect your water supply. And they wanted a seat at the table in negotiations, and they were worried that if San Francisco Public Utilities Commission wasn't providing water to places like Palo Alto that are in Santa Clara County, that they'd have to make up the difference. And so, you know, we worked on educating them for a year and a half. And, you know, right after they had uh, um, sued, we had an op-ed that says, you know, this is a huge mistake because you're going to be coming to voters at some point for a funding measure and without support from the environmental community, you know your own polls show that you're very vulnerable. Well, it came a lot sooner than we expected. They're actually considering um, putting a parcel, a parcel tax replacement on the ballot this November. So it's replacing a parcel tax that doesn't expire until 2028, but they want it, they want it to be a little different. And so they're, um, they're bending over backwards to try to appease us. We just sent a letter signed by 20, environmental and fishing organizations that, that just very clearly laid out our concerns and our recommendations and really approaching them in a let's work together on this, but kind of a veiled threat that, you know, if you don't cooperate, you're probably not going to get your parcel tax um, approved. And um, next Tuesday, they're going to be voting on whether to move forward, but they also have a closed session in the morning and they're going to talk about their, their lawsuit over the Bay Delta plan. And the new CEO has told me that he thinks he always thought it was a mistake and he's going to recommend that they drop it. And I, my sense is it's probably going to be a unanimous vote. So that'll be a nice victory for us, I hope, next Tuesday. Um, I, I kind of strayed a little bit from water conservation, but, um, that, but that is a big part of what our focus has been. Thank you. 
that's great. Uh, we did have a, a comment from Glenn who had to leave, I believe, already, but he just wanted to let you know that you had a great, clear talk, uh, very informative. Well, thank you. Yeah, I, I never know if it's, you know, a little too much in the weeds. And a lot of it is, for me, is venting my uh, frustration with these water agencies. So I, I appreciate it when people you know, hang in there and um, there's no test on any of the facts. I, you know, I know there's a lot of information, but kind of getting a general sense of that there's opportunities now, there are solutions, we need to be working together. And um, we, you know, we work with, we have a lot of volunteers who work in different levels. Some of them do just great research uh, analysis. Um, that all helps out. We're a pretty small organization. We have about 10 employees uh, in offices in Sonora, Modesto, and San Francisco. We do a lot of coalition work with other groups that have you know, legal expertise, um, you know, real connections with agencies, things like that. And something that we offer is getting people engaged and turning people out to, to speak at hearings and to help us with our advocacy. So, um, you, you know, if anyone's interested in, in learning more about that, basically whatever level people are interested in, you know, we put out the word that there's a meeting and we could use some emails going in or people calling in. Um, <clears throat> we, we love to engage people. That's outstanding. Thank you, Peter. I think that's all the questions we had for chat. Uh, Commodore, would you want to take us home now? Well, Peter, I'd like to say thank you very much. You are obviously a very well-informed um, uh, speaker on this topic. Um, terrific job. Uh, we will post this on our YouTube page. And, you know, as we all know, we're in a pandemic situation, but we'd love to have you and your family join us for brunch or lunch at the Yacht Club on the deck. Um, Tammy Blanchard, Ross Blanchard, uh, Tammy Blanchard is our rear Commodore, soon to be vice, and her husband, Ross, is a... Uh, staff commodore um and if your 11 year old is interested in junior sailing i've got a terrific place for he or she to sail a lot of which is called the saucer yacht club so All thank right. you very much peter well i appreciate that and i i definitely want to take you up on it and you just reminded me that a year ago i bid on a at an auction item which was um a polenta dinner on a, i believe a houseboat in sausalito and uh, apparently it, didn't happen because of the uh, COVID-19. Um, <clears throat> but I, I would certainly, you know, we love Sausalito and I, I would love to uh, meet you all in person when it's when the coast is clear. So thank you. Well, and thanks for the opportunity to present. Uh, I'll, to I'll, I'll take it a step further. I have a 44 de fever, the twin screw trawler. When the uh, pandemic breaks, please join me and, and guests, you know, family for a cruise on the bay. How's that sound? Well, I'd love to do that. Love to Very do that. Good. I was, a sea, I was a sea scout when I was in high school. Oh. And we, would, uh, we had a 65 foot former mine sweep that we would take up to the Delta for a week and uh, we'd go to Angel Island and um, Treasure Island and just, it was a wonderful experience. So I, I do love the Bay. Well, come back to it, okay? Will do, will do. Thank you, sir. Well, Good night, everybody, well. stay well. All the best. Thanks, Peter. Great job. Great job, Peter. It'll be on our YouTube shortly. All the best. Thank you. All right, you, Peter. Take care. Be safe. Great to see you. Great to see you too. Bye -bye. Yeah, hope to see you soon. You're welcome here anytime. Thank you. And we'll get on a Zoom soon. Yeah, let's do it. Let's do All it. Right. Thanks for doing a great talk. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thanks, Tom.